Now we are living in a time when we need to understand that the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ is more closer than when we first believed. He is more closer coming than we first believed. That means we really need to uh, brace up and really position ourselves in that position whereby uh, when he comes, when the trumpet shall sound, we shall not miss the first flight in Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, despite the fact, of, um, the fact that there are many things happening around the world, despite the, the, what is going on around the world, we have one assurance that um, we have the blessed assurance and the blessed hope that it shall be well with all of us who are believers. It shall be well. Nothing will get out of hand. Nothing will go off the script. Everything will fall in place as it ought to be. So therefore, as children of God, we need to understand a few things. And one of these things is that how to be alert uh, in the spirit. Because life as it is here, you need to understand that the physical life is a temporal life. The real life and the, most, the eternal life is the f- spiritual life. Life in the spirit is the eternal life, is the everlasting life. And this is to say, what you have here is only a playing out of a script that has already been determined in the realm of the spirit. Therefore, if you want to have victory, if you want to win at this dimension, you must win in the realm of the spirit. Hallelujah. I want to begin by saying, God has always been constantly communicating. And God is reaching out to man constantly. One time I told us, there are many times we, we are carried away by our own um, thoughts and imaginations. And this has been the case of humanity or human, human beings or mankind ever since the beginning. Man has always come up with ways and means to make him meet God. And he then uh, uh, fills up his ego and think he's the one trying to find God. Yet, according to the scripture and according to the history of humanity, it is God who has always been looking for man. It is God who has always been finding man. Because he is the creator of man. Hallelujah. The Bible says in the book of Genesis, chapter 1, or chapter 2 and 3, 1, 2 and 3, at the story of the beginnings, it talks about how God made Adam. This is, and God will visit Adam in the cool of the day. He didn't say Adam will go to visit God. It's God who came to Adam in the cool of the day, and they will have fellowship. Then he goes further, and um, in verse chapter 2, he says, and when man now fell into sin, It is God who came to look for man. It is God who offered the sin sacrifice. He killed an animal and covered man with the with the the skin of that animal. And now in this way, man was kept from destruction because God preserved man. Now, until now, the New Testament, the coming of Jesus Christ, the Bible says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Man was had no business, man was lost in his own darkness. He says in the book of uh, uh, Genesis chapter 11, God swearing, swearing, says, I will never again destroy the earth with a flood because of the sins of man. Because man is sinful right from his youth. He's just wicked. So I will never again do it. Because I now know man. I will always find a way to get to man. That tells us God has been on constant communication. God is constantly communicating, trying to reach man. And therefore, as children of God, it's upon us to raise our antennas, spiritual antennas, that we may hear from God. We may start receiving from him, because only then shall we start live, living and fulfilling the purpose of our lives. Hallelujah. Now, when we are dealing with spiritual issues, we should know that God does not deal with us as a crowd. Now, I'm talking about being uh, spiritually alert. When we are dealing with this dimension, God does not deal with us in a crowd. And it's not democratic. It's not about the will of the people, by the people, and for the people. It's neither by, uh, what you say, the euphoria. 
You see, most people have gone this side, so God is in that side. No. I know sometimes in the political rallies you hear politicians say some things which are philosophies of um, uh, European scholars in the, in the medieval times. But I think this was by a German scholar. There's a, there's a phrase that's really liked by Kenyan politicians. They say, the voice of the people is the voice of God. It's a lie. It is a lie. When the people say it, they want Barabbas instead of Jesus. That was not God talking. It was the demon talking in people. And they denied Jesus. So it doesn't mean that many people have taken a position. Then it means God is obliged to follow that position. He may let be. He may allow. But that was not his will. Hallelujah. Prophet, um, uh, priest, prophet Samuel. And they told Samuel, we want a king, an earthly king like every other earthly nation. We are tired. We want to be, to have our own king. God told Samuel. Samuel lamented, says, are you denying God? Are you rejecting God? Instead, and you want another, an earthly king in the place of God? Then God told uh, Samuel, don't worry. It is not you they are rejecting, but it is me they are rejecting. And a king, for that matter, tell them these are the consequences of having an earthly king. But since they have chosen it, let's have, let us give it to them. Now, God did not intend the children of Israel to have an earthly king, but they chose it. So that they took that way and God honored their desire, that is not the voice of God. So we must be spiritually alert and understand what is the way that God wants to take us because there are those areas that we need to understand. Hallelujah. In the book of Romans chapter 8, I want to read verse number 4 to verse number 8 so that we can understand ourselves and come in very well. Give it to me in KJV so that we, we don't mix the English. It says that the righteousness of the law might be fulfilled in us who walk not after the flesh but after the spirit. Verse number 5. For they that are after the flesh do not mind the things of the flesh. Do mind the things of the flesh. But they that are after the spirit, the things of the spirit. Hallelujah. Then verse number 6 says, For to be carnally minded is death. But to be spiritually minded is life and peace. Verse number 7. Because the carnal mind is empty against God, for it is not subject to the law of God, neither indeed can it be. Hallelujah. Now, when you read verse number 8, then you see exactly. So, so then, they that are in the flesh cannot please God. Now, this tells us something, that God is always looking for those who can please him. God is constantly looking for man that they can have fellowship. But it is the positioning of man or disposition of man that has set him not to please God. There are many who are alert in the things of the flesh. They are so much enlightened in the things of the flesh, but they are never enlightened and have been alert in the things of the spirit. And therefore he says, these ones do not please God. Now you find there are many people or you, um, uh, around the world, and this, for that matter I'm talking about Christians, who cannot please God in their dealings. And who even are not aware they need to please God. All they are doing is about self. Self-gratification. Self-satisfaction. And self-enjoyment. Um, um, so Christianity or God is only God when he's doing things for them. So they have reduced God to be a tool to get and to receive things for earthly and uh, uh, fleshly desires. Someone says, I want to serve God because God will give me money. I want to be born again because God will give me a job. I want to serve God because God will give me a spouse to marry. I want to serve God because this and that and that. That is not the way it's supposed to be. We need to serve God and worship God because he is God. Not because of what you gain. I think it's a prophet Amos. Is it Amos or, or, or Badia? Who says, even if the, uh, the stockyard shall be with no calf, even if there will be no prosperity, there will be no uh, material gain in my house, I will live for God. I will serve this living God. Hallelujah. That means, in regardless of the present conditions of your life, you shall serve God. Now, this is how we start positioning ourselves to be spiritually alert. Because God wants to talk to us. Now, why are we saying this? You need to understand, brothers and sisters, the Bible tells us in the book of 1 Peter, Let's look at 1 Peter. 
chapter number 5 verse number 8 look at first peter chapter 5 verse number 8 it says be sober be vigilant because your adversary the devil as a roaring lion walketh about seeking whom he may devour this is the reality and the fact of the matter he saying this is how things are out there mambo kwa ground ni kwamba the devil is out on the loose looking for whom to devour he's walking around looking for whom to destroy now if we are not sober and if you are not vigilant then we become victims hallelujah but peter says in verse number 9 he says whom you you should resist and overcome him just like every other of the brethren around the world because they are resisting him and overcoming now you cannot overcome the devil you cannot overcome the devil unless you are sober and you are vigilant now being sober means you are alert being sober means you are in your right senses being sober means you have the right and correct judgment of situation hallelujah praise the lord many of us here i know you came from um, uh, before christ made you you used to use some juice hallelujah and with that kind of juice from EABL you may never have proper judgment amen and that's why that's why they say do not drink and drive hallelujah because by the time the car is cruising at 120 that's when now you feel like an aeroplane you want to fly you are making wrong judgment because you are not sober hallelujah and many have lost their lives because of misjudgment or improper judgment because of not being sober now in our christian walk we must be sober and be vigilant because the adversary is out there looking for whom to devour now in second corinthians chapter number 11 i'll read verse 13 to 15 now the word of god is telling us something here as he says in in first peter he says when we are sober then we are alert we are awakened to the reality on the ground the reality of our lives that seriously we have an adversary we have an enemy now this enemy is not playing games he has been even upgraded his game his standards now he is even coming to the house of god and uh, masquerading imitating to look like the angel of light now look at second uh, corinthians chapter number uh, 11 verse number 13 to 14 to 15 it says for such are the false apostles deceitful workers transforming themselves into the apostles of Christ you see that he's talking about preachers that means the dimension of demonic activity and satanic engagements has come to higher levels whereby not every preacher indeed is a preacher of god not every preacher you see a man in a black suit or with 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 a, with a tie and a microphone does not mean he's preaching jesus because the workers of iniquity false prophets have found their way and transformed themselves into the apostles of Christ they now call themselves ministry names yet they are sorcerers some of them are witches some of them are, are, are magicians some of them are um, charlatans but now he tells us something we need to be sober and vigilant the days we are living in are evil days we are living in evil days when we are living in perilous times when evil has been let on the on, on loose and things evil things are happening now verse number 14 verse number 14 says and no marvel for satan himself is transformed into an angel of light the devil himself he has transformed himself into an angel of light and is communicating also is reaching out also remember he is also soul winning so you must be vigilant you must be sober to know who are you dealing with where are you positioned and what is your position and why are you standing what are your priorities and on what ground have you founded yourself and your faith in verse number 15 he says therefore it is no great thing if his ministers also be transformed as the ministers of righteousness whose end shall be according to their works now this is what is telling us about what is happening already and these are things that are, we are living in the present hour we are seeing them in the body of christ but what is he communicating to us is he telling us to be afraid no he's telling us to be sober and to be alert he's telling us to be alert spiritually 
This is the way we need to be. Let us not remain at the infancy. Let us not remain at a spiritual childhood level. Let us come up. Let us grow. Let us be advanced in the things of God. Let us serve God with understanding. Let us get to be enlightened in the things of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now, understand this. Satan, you need to know how he works. Now, there are times when we carry ourselves into some um, nice spiritual deceptions that end up being working against us as children of God. One of these spiritual deceptions is, now that you're born again, you are immune to satanic attack. It's a lie. It is a lie. That you are born again does not mean you are immune to the devil's attack. However, you are delivered from demonic attacks. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Because you have been delivered. God has plucked you out of the domain of darkness and has translated you into the kingdom of his dear son, the kingdom of light. Now you live in Jesus. You are superior to the devil. You overcome the devil. You have power over the devil, but you are not immune to him. So periodically, he may want to show up in your life. And this is why we should be sober and vigilant. We should be alert always. Because you don't know at what time he may be manifesting into your life. You don't know at what time he may be manipulating your thoughts. You don't know at what time he may be leading you astray from the perfect will of God for your life. Because the misunderstanding of this is what has led to many of God's children being defeated or being uh, distracted or being discouraged. You need to understand this, brothers and sisters. According to God's timing and God's program of, uh, of his universe, there is what we call the time, which is the chronology, the chronos. And there's always what you call the time, which means season. So there are seasons and times in God's plan for his universe. And this is how he operates and has said things to be happening. Now, one of the areas we must understand as God's children, that our yesterday's victories could become the biggest trap that we can help hold ourselves or be entangled in. When we live in our yesterday's victories, it is more worse than living in failure today. Because yesterday's victories can become a deception that the devil can make you, hallelujah, not be able to embrace what God is doing and the new thing God is doing in your life. Because the major trap that God's children have found themselves in, or the biggest challenge that any child of God will ever find himself, is a challenge of understanding and discerning the change of times and seasons. When God begins to start doing a new thing. When God wants to take you from where you are to where you are supposed to be. When God wants to elevate you from what has been the normal into the supernatural, the other dimension of his dealing with you. That's an area that we must be very alert. Because in a, just a slight missing, you miss a slight portion of it or just a second of it, you may find yourself totally in another way and drifting along in the opposite side of where God wanted you to take you. Remember in the Bible, in the book of uh, Luke, in the Gospels actually, there was this time Jesus has, was speaking to his disciples. And um, one time he asked them, uh, it was a personal encounter, this was a time of reckoning, just about his departure, before his death. He says, who do people say that I, the son of man, is? And then one of them says, they say you are a prophet, others say they say you are Elijah, others say you are John the Baptist, reincarnate, and um, say, one, you are one of these great teachers. Then Jesus asked them, and who do you say that I am? In other words, what has, what's your thought about me? What do, you, what do you think I am? Who do you say that I am? Then Peter showed up and says, thou art the Christ, the son of the living God. Hallelujah. And Jesus told him, ah, Peter, Simon Peter, or Simon, son of Jonah, Simon by Jonah, Flesh and blood did not reveal that to you. That must be told to you from heaven. My father is the one who has revealed that to you. And thou art, from this day, you will be called Peter. Peter means a small rock protruding that is part of a huge rock that's under the ground. 
Hallelujah. So you may be just a small protrusion of the bigger reality. So that revelation, Peter, that revelation, I will build my church and upon this rock, the revelation that I'm the son of God, and you have brought it, saying, and the gates of hell shall not prevail. Then he says, I give you keys of heaven and earth, that whatsoever you lose shall be loose, and whatever you bind shall be bound. Of course, Peter knew what that means. That was direct ordination into the office of the Pope. He was officially ordained into the ministry of the Pope. So Peter knew he's the one who has the keys. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He was superior of the rest. He's, he became great. From there now, they, they had to know. They had to organize themselves to talk to him. They need to position themselves rightly before they speak to him. They need now even to add some um, prefixes to his title. You would not just come to say Peter. No, 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 no. You have to say Mr. Peter or Pope Peter or Apostle Peter or Prophet Peter. Hallelujah. Don't just come anyhow. Do you know who I am? Jesus himself had ordained him. But a few chapters down the line, actually the next chapter, something happened. Jesus is talking. <laughs> Hallelujah. And now Peter starts saying some things. Jesus tells him, now I need to go to Jerusalem. I need to go and die there. Because my time to die has come. Now Peter pulls him aside. The Bible says, and Peter started rebuking the Lord. Can you imagine? What an audacity. See what the flesh can do to a person? The man had just missed his time. He didn't know he's missing it. He now started rebuking Jesus. Says, Jesus, you cannot be talking like that. You are confessing negatively. You must keep positive. Keep declaring the word of God. You can't start now talking negatively. You will not die. Say, I will not die and I will live. <laughs> now he's preaching to Jesus because he was ordained. Jesus had just ordained to be in the ministry. Yet he was missing it. In Luke chapter 22. Look at verse 31 to 34. Peter was missing it. Was he speaking the word of God? Yes. Was he talking positive things? Yes. Was he speaking good things about Jesus? Emphatically yes. But the man had missed his time. The, he was off his plan. He was off the track. But he didn't know. And actually it did not look like it. If you read this scripture from face value, you will not see the mistake Peter made. But look at it. Jesus talking to Peter. Uh, Luke 22, 31 to 34. He says, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, behold, Satan had desired to have you, that he may sift you like wheat. When did Jesus see this? When did this happen? I thought they were with Jesus there. I thought they were together there. I thought they were always in the presence of God and Jesus himself, the Lord himself is with them. But Jesus was seeing something in the realm of the spirit. The devil was, Car, Peter, if I catch you, if I just get an opportunity, he says, I will sift you. The devil was desirous and he was prowling on Peter, looking at him, coming to him and desiring to sift him, crush him, ground him like into powder, like wheat. But Peter did not know. All this while, Peter thinks he's in ministry. All this while, Peter thinks now, since the Pope, he's immune from demonic attacks. But Jesus took seven. Look at that too. You thought the man would be afraid. He says, but I have prayed for you. That you have, thy faith not fail not. And when thou art converted, strengthen thy brethren. Are you seeing this? Jesus is talking to Peter. says, Peter, the devil has sat on himself. I desire to sift you like wheat. But I have prayed for you. That your, faith will, that your faith will not fail. And when thou art converted, after the temptation, he says, strengthen thy brethren. You think Peter will be afraid. Or you think Peter will be grateful and say, oh master, thank you. Thank you. I didn't know. Look at 33. The man of flesh. You see how many times Christians miss their mark? He says, and he said unto him, Peter replied, Lord, I am ready to go with thee, both in prison and in death. A liar. A man speaking from the flesh. Praise the Lord. Jesus told him, Peter, stop. Stop that nonsense. You are ranting. 34. You are ranting. And many of us are ranting this way in life. I love the Lord. If God were to give me a million today, I will give, number one, I will give half of it. Half of it I will give to the church. I will release that to the work of God. And then number two, I'll look for bishop and give him 200,000. 
And then number three, I will take my brethren, all diplomats who shall go for crusade. I will only use 100,000 of that money. The moment that money comes to you, hallelujah, you forget you are born again. In fact, you don't even want to talk. Everyone says, brother, who? who? Am I your brother? Do you even know me? Do we know each other? Have we ever met? Do I know you really? Because ordinary, one ordinary million shillings has entered your account. It has changed you because you never knew the devil was desiring to sift you. All this you are making confessions and, 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 uh, and bragging around. What you don't know, sometimes you are off the mark. You are not spiritually alert. Be alert. Be vigilant. Be sober and be vigilant because out there the adversary is looking for him to devour. Now Jesus talks to him verse 34. Now Jesus, I love Jesus. Jesus is wonderful. Jesus did not tell him, oh Peter you are lying. Peter forget it. No, he says Peter. And he said, I tell you Peter. The cock shall not crow this day before thou hast thrice denied me that you know me. Jesus told him, Peter. It was around three o'clock. So he said, you know, the Lord, Master, you know me now. We have come from far. Mimi now we to me talk Bali. You know the history. You know the many things you have seen together. You know the, the tea you have drunk together, the meat you have eaten together, the missionary trips you went with you. You, you remember the things you have done. We, we have done things. Mimi me talk Bali. Jesus told him, Peter, stop it. I'm not talking about uh, bread and, and butter and, uh, and tea matter. I'm talking about life and death issues. The devil is desiring to destroy you today. But I have prayed for you that you may be strengthened. Once you are strengthened, your faith, your faith will not fail. But once you are strengthened, please encourage the brethren. Because you will have known what it means to go under or through a temptation. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. He says, but tonight... The cock will not crow three times before you do what? Before you deny me. And indeed that night, Peter denied Jesus not before soldiers. He denied Jesus not before men of war. Peter denied Jesus before a young damsel, a young girl, and a maid for that matter, a house girl. A house girl came to serve people tea. And he saw Peter and says, this man I know him. You have been a member of uh, Jesus' ministry. We know you now. We, we've been seeing you. Are you not Peter? I say, hey, Aki mama yangu. Walai, walai. Walai bilai. Mimi si jajua uyo mood. I've never seen him. I don't know even know him. <laughs> Praise the Lord. Other people are this. Ah, are you not part of his disciples? We, listen, look, your accent is betraying you. You've been drinking this Mount Kenya water for long. You are R and you are L. They are not, they, they are, there's an issue. Say, hey, hey, my name is Onyango. I don't know these people. Praise the Lord. Your very language is destroying you. You want to claim you're a Christian. You want to deny you're a Christian. But we know what you're saying. We can hear you. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Glory to Jesus. Are you catching what I'm saying? Are you catching what I'm saying? Peter denied Jesus not because he wanted to deny Jesus. What he didn't know, there was demonic activity behind the scenes. There was the devil behind the scenes. Now what he lacked is spiritual alertness. I thank God it is him now, Peter, who tells us, be sober, then be vigilant. Because your adversary, the devil, is out there like a roaring lion looking for whom to devour. He now knew it's not a matter of taking things for granted. He now understood he will not make things and treat things casually. He knew life is not casual. He now understood life is spiritual. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. This life that we are living is spiritual. And I want you to know this, brothers and sisters. The life that we are living, although we are in the physical realm, the life of this world as it is, it is not physical, and therefore we have the spiritual in the world. We have spiritual world, whereby now we have the physical world inside the spiritual. The real life, the main life, is a spiritual life. We are only having a fraction, a part of this greater life in the physical dimension for a purpose. For a purpose. And therefore, we as God's children, human beings, we are the only of his creatures that he has created in the spirit, then given us an ability to function in the physical. So we function in the spiritual and in the physical simultaneously. Praise the Lord. However, because of this, or because of that ability, 
Many of God's children have been deceived and they have been carried away and they concentrate so much on the physical where else the physical was meant to complement the spiritual. It is not the spiritual to complement the physical. Now we lost spiritual alertness. We lost spiritual awareness. We lost spiritual vigilance and soberness. We are carried away by the troublings and the cares of this world. May we be made alert this day in the name of Jesus. Praise the Lord. Therefore, that's why we should be very careful to, be, to understand how God communicates to us. God wants to communicate to us, but you must understand what is the channel that God uses to communicate to you. Now, when God is talking to us, God talks to us as a man talks to his friends. God does not talk to us in mysteries. But he talks to us individually. Each one of us here and everyone around the world as a child of God, there is a way God uses primarily to, to communicate to you. If it is God, he has to come through a particular way. Praise the Lord. Are you catching this? God does not want to antagonize your, your, your stability. There is the way you started off talking to him. Now, in that way, as you are developing yourself, primarily there's a way he comes to talk to you. For some people, it's through dreams. Praise the Lord. There is no way God would have communicated to Joseph through another means. He started out as a young boy talking to him through dreams. And that's how he continued talking to him, even to him becoming a prime minister. He used dreams to communicate to him. Am I communicating? This was the convenient and comfortable way that he would have spoken to Joseph and Joseph would have understood him. So Joseph was a dreamer and God used that avenue to talk to him. Praise the Lord. Now that does not mean every other person he'll use the dreams. The other Joseph, the father of Jesus, the Bible says God came to him in a dream and showed him that Herod is coming to kill the child. So he should run away and flee to Egypt. It was through a dream. There are other people that God will speak to them through visions. Like for Moses, the way God spoke to him, the way God started taking his attention, he saw a burning bush. And the bush was not being consumed. And that was the primary, the, 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 the way God would speak to him. He had to perform a sign. There was something that would happen. And after the burning bush, then Moses was drawn to God. And then from there, God now told him now, you shall be performing something to him. He told him now, what are you holding in your hand? A stick. He says, put on the ground. He put on the ground. It became a snake. Now see, that is the rod of God. Pick it up again by the tail. He picked it up. And throughout the ministry of Moses, it was through that stick that he performed miracles, signs and wonders. Hallelujah. Are you catching this thing? There was a way God would speak to him. You also, there's a way God talks to you. There is a way. However, this way, God develops it based on your fellowship and your spiritual maturity. As you grow spiritually and you become more alert in the spirit, then this avenue becomes more clear and more profound way for God to talk to you. Praise the Lord. You need also to understand this, that the spirit man, which is the real you, has senses just as your physical body has senses. Your physical body has what we call five common senses. Amen? Your spirit man has his own senses also. However, I don't know how many they are. They are not five. But they are many because in the realm of the spirit. But he also feels he is grieved. He has a sense of feeling. He has a sense of touch. He has sense, a sense of hearing. He has a sense of sight. That's why when you when we need to develop yourself in the realm of the spirit. So that you are able to see... When your eyes see in the realm of the spirit, you are able to see beyond the limitations in the physical. Praise the Lord. The Bible says, and God came to, to uh, the man Joshua when they were by just about to cross into the land of Canaan, but there was a walled city, fortified city of Jericho. God told him, Joshua, see, I have given you Jericho. He didn't say look. He said, see, you may be looking, but you're not seeing. Seeing is an attribute of the spirit. Looking is by the optical eye. Your physical eye decodes the image. 
But the discernment to understand what image are you seeing is it comes from your spirit. It's a training of your spirit. It's to that eye that when David came at the battlefield and he saw Goliath, a huge giant, every other person was looking at a giant, a man of war, terrifying creature. But David was looking at a man who has got no defense in him. He was seeing. And that was gave him a, a, a confidence to say, this day you have come to me and defiling the armies of God. Yes, you have come to me with javelin and spear and weapons of war. But I am coming against you in the name of the Lord. And today I shall give your carcass to the birds of the air. Praise the Lord. The vulture shall, shall, shall feast on your body today. Now, as far as Goliath is concerned at that moment, in fact, he was angry. He was furious. He felt so insulted by the Israelites. He says, of all the people, you are sending to me a boy to come and fight with me. Can't you even have respect for who I am? I'm a man of war. Could you find anyone, a champion among your people, so that at least we can have a fair contest? Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But David is coming as a young boy with no weapon, with no armory, with no uh, this attires, clothes of war. Indeed, actually Saul had tried to give him some, some um, clothes of war so that he can wear them. And David tried them says, I am not trained in this. I am not used to using this. Remember, I'm just coming from shepherding sheep and goats. But there, while there, I killed a bear and I killed a lion. And this Philistine shall be among them today. I shall still kill him the same way. What, what did David understand? David had an understanding that life is spiritual. And as he was looking at Goliath, he was seeing his defense has left him. Praise the Lord. There was no spirit in Goliath. Or rather the spirit in Goliath was subject to the spirit that was in him. So he saw this man has got no defense. And that's what gave him the confidence to come forward. Remember this, brothers and sisters. We win. We succeed. Or success, victories, failures, death and life are first consummated in the realm of the spirit. You must understand that reality very well. Before you leave your house, and that's why we are having the prayer meetings we have. We are having sessions of sharing the word of God. So that we are edified in the realm of the spirit that we can see and when we get out of our houses, we are not bumping into and colliding with forces. No. We are getting out and we are, our steps are ordered by the Lord. We know where to go. Why? We have had an opportunity to meet with the Father in our closet. So as we come out, we are not coming out as ordinary men. We are not stepping out just like any other person. No, we are stepping out with the consciousness that we are victors. We are more than conquerors. For John says, for greater is he that is in you than he that's in the world. Who is in you? Who is in you? If you are to look inside of you, you are to open inside of you, shall we find a person? No. Not at all. It is the spirit man, the Holy Ghost that's in you. He's bigger than the one in the world. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. So by understanding how God communicates to us, we become aware. So do not treat the spiritual communications anyhow. For example, for those of us who he uses dreams to communicate to us, be alert and also learn. Don't just say dreams is how God talks to me. So I will, what, whatever dream comes to me is God talking to me. No, no, no. Because we have just learned from the second Corinthians chapter, chapter 11, verse 13 and 14, 15. He says, the enemy, the devil, can also masquerade as the angel of light and bring you some dreams. So you should know how to crown those dreams. By what? By studying the word of God. The way to grow and become alert spiritually, number one, is by studying the word of God. We must be built on the word of God. We must be based on the word of God. Because the word of God will help us design, will help us judge, will help us uh, evaluate the quality of the information coming to us, then we will know its root and its source. Because God does not contradict himself in his word. He does not. If he gave you a dream that contradicts his word, it's not God. If he gives you a dream or you see a dream 
that uh, does not align itself with the word of God, it is not God. So you must know and judge it. Because sometimes there are things that are of men. Just like Peter was speaking things of men. Remember before that time when he rebuked Jesus, Jesus told him, get thee, be, get thee behind me, Satan. For you mind the things of the flesh and not the things of God. I thought he had just said this Peter. Now he's calling him Satan. The devil had entered Peter. So Peter was speaking the words of the devil. And he was speaking with boldness, thinking that he's now talking good things. And he's prophesying the Lord. And he's, he's encouraging the Lord. But Jesus knew this one does not understand. He's now speaking for the devil. Hallelujah. Until you grow in the word of God, you may not know this. So to be spiritually alert, number one, you must grow in the word of God. Grow in the knowledge of the things of God. This will make your relationship with him more clear. And will, give, uh, will start giving you clear communications from the throne room. The other way God may talk to us is through visions. And through word of knowledge. There are some of us, because of the relationship we have with Jesus, or with God and the spirit of God, we find that the knower in you is enlightened. The knower, the knower in you, the part of you that knows things. You just know. You just have a discernment. You just know this is not right. Or this is God talking to me. Or this is the way to go. As he says in the book of Isaiah, he says when you shall get in a crossroad, don't worry. Because you shall hear a voice behind you telling you this is the way. Follow ye through it. The spirit of God will just be with you. But this depends on how much you have given yourself to fellowship with the word of God and fellowship with the spirit of God and thereby matured in the things of God. Praise the Lord. When God was speaking to Abraham and telling him, leave your father's land and uh, your father's house and come out of this city, uh, the Chaldeans, and get to a place I'll show you, it was not anything spectacular. Don't think that there was thunder and there was lightning when God was talking. Actually, it was just that soft, still voice. But it was persistent and Abraham was conscious of the spiritual leading. And that's how he decided to move. As I said, in such a scenarios, it takes spiritual maturity to understand and spiritual alertness to understand when times and seasons are changing. There are some times when God wants you to relocate, maybe from one city to another city. And there are times he does not want you to relocate. But sometimes we are forcing ourselves because everyone else is going to America. We want to go to America. Hallelujah. Has God sent you to America? Are you going for his purpose there in America? Have you heard him clearly sending you to America? Some of us is saying stay, but we are struggling to go. Some of us he says go, and you are struggling to stay. You must know, for example, the place where you are working today. Has God told you to move from that place? Or are you just applying to move because every other person is moving for greener pastures? You may, God may want you to stay. Even though the salary may not be that much, God wants you to stay. Because there is something he wants to still do in your life. Through that company or in that place where you are working. Praise the Lord. This also comes with ministry life. Don't just move from church to church. Hope from one ministry to another. Because people are moving from ministries. No, stay. Stay. It takes maturity to stay. It takes maturity. It's one of the indicators that you are born again. And that you are mature spiritually. The ability to stay. The Bible says about Joshua and Caleb. He says, and these are the only ones who left Egypt as teenagers. And they are the only ones who left Egypt, went through the wilderness, and were able to enter Canaan land. And they conquered and settled in Canaan land. But the two, among the two, the Bible says, and Caleb was a man of faith. Vibrant in faith. However, he says something about Joshua. And Joshua, the son of Nun, is the one that stayed behind with Moses and was always early with Moses in the tent of meeting. So Joshua was always there with Moses. Although Caleb was a man of faith, he was not always there with Moses. Praise the Lord. Are you catching this? Early in the morning, as Moses going to the tent of God of meeting, Joshua was there, serving Moses. 
Before, when everyone else leaves, before everyone gets to their own house, Joshua will not leave Moses until he knows that the man of God has left, he has gone now to his own house. That's when now Joshua will leave and go. For more than 40 years. And that's how now, when Moses is about to die, God told him, ordain Joshua in your place. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Some of us young ministers and young boys and girls, I know you are young in ministry. This is where the deception comes in. You think leadership is by impartation. It's a lie. Praise the Lord. It's a lie. True leadership comes by staying. You want to be the next prophet. You must stay. The Bible says, and Elijah, <laughs> Elijah was one who poured water on the hands of Elijah. That's how he became the next prophet. Throughout the ministry of Elijah, there were other prophets. There were other junior prophets in the land. There were those in the school of ministry of prophets with Elijah, in the school of ministry of Elijah. But it's Elisha who poured water. That means he served the prophet. And that's how the mantle fell upon him. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. You see prof, uh, uh, ministers running from Helter Skelter uh, uh, or oh, hope hoping from all over. I'm going to this ministry to be imparted. I'm going to there to be imparted. I'm going there to be okay. Keep on being imparted. But what you are imparted can also depart. Praise the Lord. What you are imparted can also depart. What stays, the anointing that stays is the anointing that you have served and you have stayed on it. That one will stay. Praise Jesus. Am I communicating? When the disciples of Jesus, that day when everyone was angry with Jesus, because Jesus told them now, you must eat my body and drink my blood. If you don't do that, you're not part of my ministry. Everyone left Jesus. Jesus looked at them and says, are you not also going? The disciple says, Master, <laughs> you are the only one who has the, the word of life. And we have found it. We are not going anywhere. Do what you want. We are not going anywhere. And they stayed with him. This became the apostles of old. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. What was the criteria for them becoming the apostles? Because they had been with Jesus. They had seen him. How do we know? When they were appointing somebody to replace Judas, they said they want somebody who has been with them from the beginning and has been with them until the death and burial and resurrection of Jesus Christ. That is the one who qualified to become an apostle. Praise the Lord. Had been among them, not just with them, among them. So they wanted someone who had what? Stayed. So the way to mature and the way to learn on how to serve God and to be spiritually alert, you must learn to stay. Tell your neighbor, stay. Stay in the presence. Praise the Lord. That day, young boy, Samuel, the Bible says, and Samuel laid beside the ark of the covenant. When God came calling, wanting to talk to Samuel, Samuel was not anywhere in the house of God. The Bible says he laid by the side of the Ark of the Covenant. Remember, there was a prophet of the day, the priest of the day, was Eli. Eli had two sons, Hophni and Phineas, who were supposed to serve after him. They were elders now. They were real, already serving with him. But they were careless. They were rascals. They were indisciplined. They were never in the house of God. But it is Samuel who laid, as a young boy, he was lying by the Ark of the Covenant. He was lying there. That's where he used to stay. That's where he used to sleep. And God came by the night and said, Samuel, Samuel. But he was calling in the voice of Eli. So Samuel woke up and went to Eli and said, uh, uh, Sir, you called me. He said, No, I didn't call. For three times, he says, Now, next time he calls, say, Here I am, I am, sir. Talk to me. Or here I am, Lord. Speak, I am hearing. And God spoke to Samuel as a young lad. How did it happen? By staying. Praise the Lord. Most of our prayers are not answered because we don't stay. We don't stay. Many a times we are not receiving answers to our prayers. Not because they are not answered. But when we go to prayer, we are, Father in the name of Jesus, thank you. I have my car. I have my needs. I have my, my health. I have everything given to me. In Jesus name, Amen. You are living up. Immediately you say amen. You are saying amen as you are closing your door. You are leaving. You either pray when you want to leave or you pray the last, last hour of the day when you want to sleep. So our prayers are basically when you want to leave or when you want to doze off. So you never are there to hear or to receive answers to your prayers. 
Learn to stay. Tell your neighbor, learn to stay. Praise the Lord. Hallelujah. These are having, now it says growing and becoming spiritually alert. Because you want to receive signals. You want to receive information from God. You want to receive information from God. Now sometimes, you must understand this. Be alert spiritually. Because of the intensity or the importance or the magnanimity of your ministry or your destiny as a child of God and the many lives you will come to impact and the many things that you come to impact there are ways that God may lead you that is not the uh, how do I say it? the conventional way that every other person goes through please learn to stay because there is a purpose for you you are unique praise the Lord you are unique don't bolt out. Don't unruffle the waters. Don't follow the euphoria. Don't follow the masses. You are unique. There's a destiny God is leading you into. There's a place you ought to get to. And that place, it will take your discipline to get there. Many of God's children have died without even starting to fulfill their purpose and their destiny. Not because of the devil but because of their indiscipline to learn to follow God's leading. Amen? Praise the Lord. Yes, so many. Many people are living other people's lives. Look here, you are 30 now. And every other, your schoolmates are driving cars. But you, you are still serving in the house of God. You are still in the ministry. You think you are losing it. Whereas God is preparing you for your greater destiny. Now you, leave, you quit ministry, you leave church, you go on in business, and you go out there, you want to struggle with other, your colleagues out there, your schoolmates, so that you may also drive, so that you may also look like you are making it. Look here, brothers and sisters. <laughs> Life is personal. Life is per head. Am I communicating? What you don't know, you don't know where they are going to end up. They are fulfilling their purpose. Are you fulfilling your purpose? Your purpose is not fulfilled or you don't look like you're fulfilling your purpose by the amount of money you have amalgamated. It's not about the wealth you have amassed that determines how purposeful you are. Jesus Christ, our Lord Jesus Christ, was not a wealthy man. The Bible says he died in poverty. Are you catching this? He died in poverty. He died the death of a poor man. He never had material possessions. Jesus never had cars and, um, and lands and properties. He never had them. Although all things were for, for him. And the grace of God in him was upon him. Was the grace of wealth. But he became poor so that you may become wealthy. Am I communicating? Just imagine if Jesus would say now I want to start. I've come here on earth as a son of God. So I, I am I'm the founder of the son of God ministries worldwide. So bring tithe. Bring resources to me. Headquarters in Jerusalem. Would he have fulfilled his purpose? His purpose was die to die as a poor man. So that through his poverty, he may deliver all humanity from the destructions of death and poverty. In Jesus' name. Hallelujah. Are you cutting this thing? Learn to fulfill your purpose. When God is talking to be spiritually alert. The things that are happening in your life. There are some of the things that you're going through right now, brothers and sisters. It's not the devil. It is God. The conditions may not be as comfortable. It is not the devil. It is God. For example, in the Old Testament, let's look at an example of the Old Testament. Not even Old Testament. Yes, Old Testament. Until John the Baptist, actually Jesus Christ himself, in his earthly ministry, he was living in the Old Testament. He came in the Old Testament. The prophets in the Bible, especially the Old Testament prophets, all of them were seers. They will see the visions of God. And they will foretell the things of God. They prophesy about the future of the world and the events on the world. But there was something about them, hallelujah, that we must learn. God never dealt with them in the same way. Each one of them, God communicated to him in a unique way. Praise the Lord. However, the ways and the, um, the way God used them, if you are to be used right now, you look like a madman. 
It was not conventional. Actually, the most powerful prophets, those that had powerful messages, they were never used conventionally. Their life was not conventional life. The events in their life, as they are prophesying the word of God, was not conventional. Some of it looked like madness. Some of it looked like scattered heads. Some of it looked like confusion. But that was the power of God in their lives. Blessed be to God that these men stayed and they fulfilled God's purpose. They were spiritually alert. That's why we call them prophets of God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Of course, in heaven, they have their portion. Among the saints. These are the saints who are sitting in the heavenly throne. Praise the Lord. Are you catching this thing? The Bible says, when you look at how God used these prophets, it was, no longer, it was not at all conventional. It was anything else but conventional. So they were not fashionable. They didn't look, the Bible says in the book of Hebrews, it says, and they meandered around in sheepskin. Some of them despaired in life. But they never gave up hope because they were hoping for the salvation. These ones whom the world was not worthy. I think Hebrews 11, the last, the last verse in the book, the book of Hebrews 11. Look at Hebrews 11, the last verse. Look at verse number 39. Go to 39. Or 38. It says, And this all having obtained a good report through faith, Receive not the promise. Who are these? Go to verse number 38, 37, so that we can see who are these, the word of God talking about. 37. Quickly. It says, They were stoned, they were sown asunder, were tempted, were slain with the sword. They wandered about in sheepskins and goatskins, being destitute, afflicted, tormented. Verse 39, 38. Talking about the men of old. These are prophets of old. The Generals of faith, of whom the world was not worthy, they wandered in deserts and in mountains and in dens and caves of the earth. Now, the Bible says, and of whom the world was not worthy. It's not, it's not that they were not of the world. The world was not worthy of them. And now they were wandering in, in tombs, in, uh, in caves, in dens. They went about in goat skins and sheep skins. They were almost walking naked because as far as they were concerned, this world was not worthy of them. Not that they were not of the world. They were not worthy of the world. The world was not worthy of them. That is to say, God had provided even a way out to salvage and save them and give them provisions. But they said, it's not necessary. This world is not worthy us. Why? They knew they carried a more precious promise. Verse 39. 39 says, And all this, and this all, having obtained a good report through faith, Received not the promise. They had a good report. They were men of faith. They had everything. God was provided some, a way out for them. But they had not received the promise. What was the promise? Christ Jesus. Praise the Lord. They were looking at the promise. Because they had prophesied about the promise. Verse 40. It says. God having provided some, some, better, some better things for us. That they without us should not be made perfect. Because God wanted to bring the promise and unite the entire church, the old and the new testament church as one bride, the bride of Jesus. So they would not have entered their rest until we came. And that was the purpose of it. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Now look at this. This tells you, I'm saying this, I just wanted to show you, that your life has, uh, does not have to be conventional for you to know God is with you. You do not have to have bread and butter, you do not have to have fashionable clothes for you to really feel that God is with you. You do not have to have money in your bank account for you to really feel that God is with you. The presence of God in our lives is not measured by the material possessions we have. God is not even determined by the, the type of car you drive. I know sometimes, especially ministers of the gospel, men of God for that matter, we tend to push our brethren to an age of materialism. Want to make you feel that God is with me because I'm driving a Range Rover. Look here. There are thieves who are driving Range Rovers. Is it so? Do you agree with me? There are wicked men and women who are driving powerful cars. Because it's all about buy, buying a car. So the anointing in my life or on my life is not defined and determined by the type of car I drive. Or the type of suit I wear. And that's why I like putting on my suits. Because 
with a suit you can never know you cannot just look at me and say this suit is this amount of money but every other type of dress you now say that dress is 50000 this one is 20000 with a suit you don't know whether it's 5000 or it's 10000 whatever it's just a suit as long as i'm smart it's okay that's why i do that i put on suits because of that purpose i don't want you to judge me by material value i am more valuable than money hallelujah praise the lord are you catching this thing now look at for example let me just show you an example of three prophets of god that we can learn something from them the bible says prophet number one isaiah the major prophet he says that isaiah was told to prophesy for three years in jerusalem naked talking about the major prophet god told him to strip naked and be walking in jerusalem the major city of the day like being told to go to nairobi and be walking in the cbd naked for three years isaiah 20 verse 2 to 4 look at that scripture very unconventional way of operating but this is god so sometimes things i'm just trying to you that things are the way they are not necessarily it is the devil let us be spiritually alert maybe god is birthing something in you isaiah 20 verse 2 to 4 at the same time Speak the Lord by Isaiah, the son of Amos, saying, Go and lose the sackcloth from off thy loins. Okay, give it to me in NIV. Let's read it, this in NIV. At that time, the Lord spoke through Isaiah, the son of Amos. He said to him, Take off the sackcloth from your body and the sandals from your feet. And he did so, going around stripped barefoot. Verse number 3. Then the Lord said, just as my servant Isaiah has gone stripped and barefoot for three years as a sign and potent against Egypt and Cush. Verse number four. He says, so the king of Assyria will lead away stripped and barefoot Egyptian captives, Cushite exiles, and young and old with their bam bam bare to the Egyptians' shape. Hallelujah. Are you seeing this? You open their behind. So that they will be walking so that for the shame. Now, would God have just, God is God. Would he just have used another method? He told this man to strip himself. His bam bam is out. So that people may know this is how it's going to happen. Isaiah was married. Isaiah was an old man. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. But God is using him in a very unconventional way at this time. Strip your clothes. Now walk in the city naked. And now he's not even prophesying for Israel. He's a prophecy to the land of Egypt and the land of Ethiopia. And he's not talking about how Ethiopia and Egypt will be beaten by Israel. It's the land of Assyria. Which is not an Israel. Uh, <laughs> Assyria will beat Egypt and, and, uh, and Ethiopia. So, strip your clothes. You are in that house because God wants you to be in that house. You are living in the neighborhood you are living in because God wants you to be there. There is something God is preserving or God is communicating or God is preparing you. Praise the Lord. Are you catching this thing? So sometimes we, we want to lament. Oh God, why don't I have money? Oh God, look at my mates. All of them are married. Why am I not married? Look at me, God. Look at me. Just imagine if Esther, the Bible says about Queen Esther, if Esther would have been in the house of God, say, God, give me Mr. Handsome. I want to marry a young man, a tall, dark, and handsome young man. Where else God had prepared a king and said the king would divorce, then she would be married in the kingdom. She would become a queen. If she had prayed for to be married by a young man, she would not have fulfilled God's purpose. Is it so? This marriage was ordained by God. Vashti had to be divorced. For Esther to be married. It was God's ordaining. So Esther was in the will of God. A young damsel, a young girl. Beautiful for that matter. Just holding on. Staying with his uncle. Staying in his house. Waiting on God. She was 30. The Bible says, when you see, Bible historians will tell, she was almost, almost 40 years to 50 years when she was getting married. Esther was not 17 years old. Praise the Lord. She was not a 17 year old girl. She was almost 50. Actually 50, 60. Some scholars say so. But she was so pretty. So beautiful. That she beat all the other small, small girls hands down. 
One encounter with the king. The king said, I found a wife. Hallelujah. Just one night, one encounter, she appeared before the king. The king said, this is the wife I was talking about. Just imagine if she was killing herself when she was 25. Like most of you girls now say, you know, my biological clock is ticking. You see, if I don't, you know, you know, if, if I don't do this, if I don't get married by this brother, I want to get married now, now. You are walking out of the will of God for your life. You are walking out of the will of God for your life. Learn to stay. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise Jesus. Learn to be in the will of God. Learn to be in the will of God. Allow the will of God to prevail. There was a lady in the Bible called Abigail. Abigail was a, a, a wife of someone called Naboth. Naboth's name means fool. Abigail was married to a fool. Brilliant girl, but her husband was a fool. And while she was there, she was a wonderful wife to a fool. And the fool, one day, there was judgment on his life. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Abigail never despaired in a marriage. Abigail never contravened or never did anything stupid with her life. She never gave up in her life. She remained a noble woman. She remained a wonderful lady. How do I know? The Bible says on that day, when David was coming to destroy Naboth because he had insulted him, Abigail took the donkeys and bread and everything, every good stuff, and he went to meet David. And when he met David, he says, David, we know you are anointed. Forget about my husband. He's a fool. But for you, take this bread. There's some cake here. There's juice here. Please go and eat. There's roast meat. Go and enjoy yourself. We know God is with you. The Bible says, when she came back, Naboth was stricken by paralysis. He died in his sleep. Of course, who came for the funeral? David. After the funeral, Abigail became the wife of a king. Praise the Lord. <laughs> from right from marrying a fool, she automatically became the wife of a king. And all her life, she reigned in the kingdom of Israel. Your future is certain in God. Where you are is not the end of your life. So don't kill yourself. Remain in the will of God. Remain in the purpose of God. She's not the one girl who was been running around. Oh no, he marriage. I find a kazi. Oh, apa na teso sana. We mutu nimbaya. She remained. She stayed. God was orchestrating something, and then she landed in the hand of a king. Praise the Lord. Glory to Jesus. So what is going, what you're going through? You may be being shamed right now. You may be going through humiliation right now. People may be calling you names. Some people may be saying you don't have your own house. You are squatting. Until when will you have your own house? Relax. Relax. God does not want you to rent a house. God wants you to move into your own duplex. A mansion, a five bedroom mansion. A house you never built. Because the Bible says in the book of Isaiah. And you shall live in houses you never built. You shall live eat vines you never planted. Glory to God. For God gives labor to unbelievers so that they can heap up and gather and so that he can give to the righteous. Are you the righteous of God? Are you the righteous of God? Whatsoever your money cannot buy, you shall receive it free course and hindered in the name of Jesus. Glory to God. Are you catching this thing? Now, number two, look at Hosea. The Bible talks about Hosea, prophet Hosea. It's a prophet of God. A man of God for that matter. But the Bible says in Hosea chapter 1 verse number 2, God told him to marry a prostitute. Now you wonder, has this brother fallen from the grace? Has this brother, that, there's no, that, does it mean there's no sister in church? No, you, you should marry a good wife and then go and prophesy to the prostitute. But God tells him, no, 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 go to the house. Hey, uh, Hosea chapter 1, verse number 2. When the Lord began to speak through Hosea, the Lord said to him, Go take yourself an adulterous wife and children of unfaithfulness because the land is guilty of the wildest adultery in departing from the Lord. Give it to me in KJV. KJV says, look at it. The beginning of the word of the Lord by Hosea. And the Lord said to Hosea, Go take unto thee a wife, a wardoms of wardoms and children of wardoms. For the land had committed great wardom departing from the Lord. 
because of what the nation had done, and this man is a prophet, he says, go and also marry a prostitute. Not because of anything, so that you may show an example. Hmm. <laughs> Praise the Lord. When you read the book of Isaiah, his lamentation of what his wife was doing to him. He will buy everything. He will put everything in the house. She will go to the street, Koinange. When she has just prepared everything, she will be in Koinange. Are, are you catching what I'm saying? Hosea will be troubled. He will go with people, pick her, carry her, bind her with straps, bring her in the house, lock the house. The moment she just finds a way to escape, Koinange. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. The man will ask, Bishop, what have I done? Why me? Why only me to go through this? Every other person is happily married. Why only me? Because it's only you. Your destiny is special destiny. Hallelujah. You have a unique destiny to fulfill in Jesus' name. Glory to God. So sometimes the things that are happening to us, please, be spiritually alert. Don't be quick to say, no, no, no. Me, I can't take it. Me, I can't take it. No, me. <laughs> me, I can't take it. No, continue. That's why you're losing your destiny. That's how Vashti was. When the king called him, said, come and, you are beautiful. Come and showcase yourself before my ministers and my guests. They, let them see the type of woman I have. And they'll dress up both for you. I've taken you for shopping. What else? Says, me. Is it me now? To come before people parade myself. Do you know who I am? He said, Okay. The elder said, King, this woman is rude. In fact, to teach her a lesson, divorce her. Let her go back to her father's house. Collect another girl. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. Pride. You may lose your plan, your destiny, your purpose in life through pride. Trying to show you are somebody. Who are you? Anyway. You know, this, this, as Christians, sometimes we, we get this ego. Because of the small, small victories God has given to us, in a few ways, God has used us, cast us a few demons here and there, partner with the ministry in a particular way, so you become a somebody. Do you know who I am? Do you know how much I've been praying in the house of God? Do you know how many years I've been serving God? Continue. Praise the Lord. The Bible says there was a prophetess called Hannah. She was 84. And she had been in the house of God, never departing, waiting for one thing only, to see the Lord Jesus Christ. She never made noise. She never harassed anybody. Praise the Lord. She never harassed anybody. Learn to stay. And be spiritually alert. Because God is doing something in your life. The events in your life are basically just preparing you. For the greater things that God has in store for you. And you cannot get there until you are prepared. Praise the Lord. Hosea would not have become a great prophet of God until he was prepared. He's one of the major prophets. Praise the Lord. A great prophet that prophesied the nation of Israel. But his marriage was not okay. So sometimes you see things in your, in your life, and of course, let me talk this to this too. Sometimes you're going through issues in your marriage, or there was something that happened in your marriage, and now you want to work with that label. Say, you know me, my marriage did not work. You know me, this happened to me. No! It happened that way for the purpose of God. That's where you are, what you are now. Don't call yourself that thing. I, Hosea never called himself the husband of a harlot. No, he called himself Hosea. Mr. Hosea. Husband to Madame so and so. And we, they knew her behavior. Praise the Lord. Are you catching this thing? Now get to know why is God leading you there? And why is these things happening? Because definitely there's something that God wants to fulfill in your life and through you. The Bible says, uh, point number three, look at Ezekiel, how God, uh, her, her name was Goma, okay, sorry, Goma, the daughter of Diblaim, which was conceived and bare him a son. Glory to God, Goma, the wife of Hosea. Okay, a brother want to say, Bishop, I want to go and marry from Koinange. It's okay. Do you have a ministry that you need to restore the nation? <laughs> so don't just go there because you're going there. Has God sent you there? Has God sent you there? I remember there was a, a young man. There were two, two young men in church. They told me one time, Bishop, we have walked town. And we are seeing these twilight girls. Beautiful, beautiful girls. They can't go to hell. 
We have a ministry. God has given us a ministry. We want to start going and win, win, win souls. We want to soul win them. I said, where? Soul win girls on the street. Uh, at what time? What time are they out, really? Around 11 o'clock, 12 o'clock. You want to go and soul win them there? In their office? Ah, forget it. Forget it. You need deliverance. It is you who needs deliverance. They don't need deliverance. You know what you're going to do there. Soul winning. When they are in the office now, you're going to soul win them. <laughs> Please don't, don't put yourself in temptation. Amen? Praise the Lord. God did not send you that ministry, so don't go there. Amen? Praise the Lord. Look at Ezekiel chapter 4, verse number 4 to 9. Ezekiel was meant to lie down one side for one and a half years. In fact, God, God told him, prepare food. Bring beans, lentils, unga, put them there. You will not wake up. For one and a half years. Huh. Look at Ezekiel chapter 4. Verse 4. Then lie on your left side and put sin on the, of the house of Israel upon yourself. You are to bear their sin for the number of days you lie on your side. Verse number 5. I have assigned you the same number of days as the years of their sin. So for 390 days, you will bear the sin of the house of Israel. Verse number 6. After you have finished this lie down again, this time on your right side, and bear the sin of the house of Judah, I have assigned you 40 days, a day for each year. So 390 plus 40, how many is that? 430? 430? A year has how many days? 365 minus 430? 75 days. Okay. So the man lay down for one year and uh, four months. One side. Left side. And just look at how it was. Look at verse number three before we go, go forward. Look at verse number three. Verse number three says, look at this. Then take an iron pan. Place it as an iron wall between you and the city. And turn your face toward it. It will be under siege. And you shall besiege it. This will be a sign to the house of Israel. It says put a bed down. Then put an iron bar. Iron sheet. To cover you and the city. So that you are looking into the iron. You are not seeing the city. And then you are prophesying. For 390 days. Lie on your left side. You are eating there. You are doing everything there. No turning. Verse number 6. Look at verse number 6. Go talking. After you have finished this, lie down again this time on your right side and bear the sin of the house of Judah. I have assigned you 40 days and a day for each year. Verse number 7. Verse number 7 says, Turn your face toward the siege of Jerusalem and with the bare arm prophesy against her. With open hands, turn your face toward the siege of Jerusalem and with bare arms Professor, lift your hands there and prophesy against her. Then verse number 8, he says, he says, I will tie you up with ropes so that you cannot turn from one side to other until you have finished the days of your siege. Are you catching this thing? So sometimes you're going through a situation. Please be spiritually alert. This is the message today. Be spiritually alert. Because some things you're going through, God is leading you through it. For the purpose of the greater good of God. There's a destiny you are making. Remember, he has called us. The Bible says he has called us. And he has made us priests and kings unto God and the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ. So you are a priest for your nation. You are a priest for your family. Some of the things you are going through is because of the prophetic word of your family. Where you need to take your people. Hallelujah. I'm talking about family. I'm talking about the people you are born among. You are the one who bring light among them. But you see, it's not a walkover. There are some prophetic preparations that must appear. Because everything must be lined up in the realm of the Spirit. Glory to God. While that is happening, you are the one to bear the brand. You are, that's the reason why you're going through what you're going through. And that's why you are born in that family. Hallelujah. Glory to God. He says, and you shall take upon yourself the sin of Israel. And then so that you may see... As you are doing this, you are interceding, then prophesy against 
against their sins. You can't just wake up and say you are an authority in your family until you have had some encounter in the spirit. And this encounter comes by the, some responsibilities that are given to you in the place of prayer, as a burden of ministry, the things that you carry in your heart, the heaviness you have in your heart concerning your loved ones. This is what gives you the effort, the power, the ability to intercede for them. Glory to God. Hallelujah. Praise the Lord. So as a child of God, this is the message. Be sober and be vigilant. Because God is taking you through a process. God is leading us in a way. God is making us go through something. So that we may birth something greater. We are the prophets of our nation. We are the prophets of our families. We are the prophets of our life. So don't budge up. Stay. Stay. Because there's something God is preparing. In Jesus name. Shall we stand up on our feet and just lift our hands before the, before the Lord as I pray with you right now. Just lift up your hands and let us pray. Yes, lift up your hands please. Everyone also watching me from um, whatever platform you're watching, just lift up your hands in faith as we pray this prayer right now in the name of Jesus. Father, thank you Father. We your children are before you now. Father, I pray for every one of them. Father, I present them, Father, unto you. And Lord, Father, may you guide them and Father, lead them in the way they should follow. Father, you've learned according to your word. But Father, today, we are spiritually alert. We are alert in our spirits. The spiritual slum, slumberness, spiritual slothfulness, Father, is removed from us. Every covering of heaviness, every cloud of heaviness, that causes or blocks the spiritual antennas is removed right now. We cast it out in the name of Jesus. Father, we declare everyone of us, Father, is spiritually alert. Alert to hear from you. And Father, we thank you. We even receive grace to go through what we are going through now. Father, for if it's your God in your will, we would have wanted the cup to be taken away from us. But let your will be done. Let your will be fulfilled in our lives. In the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Lord Father, thank you. We gladly accept your will. And Father, we gladly humble ourselves at your feet, Lord. And thank you, Father. Father, we have comforted, Father, with this one thing. That, Father, we know that everything is working together for the good of all who are called according to your purposes. Father, for you predestined us for this greatness, for this life, and for this day and time. Therefore, Father, with the same power, we know we are overcomers. We have victory, Lord. We have strong strength and grace to come out of this situation. And Father, come out brilliantly. As gold tried in the furnace, Father, we are coming out glowing. We are radiating your glory. In the mighty name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. We pray this in Jesus' name, our Lord. Amen. Hallelujah. Now, I want to pray for someone uh, out there. You're watching us. And you have not given your life to Christ. And you say, man of God, what do I do so that I can also be part of the family of God? Right now, I just want to give you that opportunity uh, by leading you into the house and the fellowship of God. Scripture says in the book of Romans chapter number 10, verse number 13, it says, if you shall call upon the name of the Lord, you shall be saved. Verse number 9 and 10 says, if you believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, then says you shall be saved and if you confess with your mouth because with your mouth if you confess with your mouth Jesus is Lord and believe in your heart that God raised him from the dead you will be saved that's the only qualification for salvation so I want you to confess right now I'll help you confess him that he is Lord of your life so kindly say this prayer with me in faith in Jesus name both those of us who are in the house and out there online, just say this prayer and receive your salvation right now in the mighty name of Jesus Christ. Let's pray. And church, help me to say these words of confession in Jesus' name. Say, Lord Jesus, I believe in my heart that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for the sins of the world. I therefore confess this day you are the Lord of my life. Henceforth, I will live for you. In Jesus' name. 
Amen. Now you've said that prayer, that confession, you are born again. But I would like to lead you and help you more with more information and guide you in the way to go. And more information on how to live a godly life. So kindly go to our inbox and let me know. Uh, uh, talk to me on the inbox. So you can know. Uh, just tell us your name and where you are watching us from and that say I'm the one who has given life. I've, been, I've gotten born again today. And then we'll continue praying with you and guiding you and supplying with more information and materials that you may grow by in faith. So God bless you. Thank you. Thank you so much.